Let us begin. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to all of you joining us from Latin America, and good afternoon to those of you who are on the other side in Europe. My name is Josa Robergat. I am responsible for advocacy in EU LAC, and I will be coordinating this meeting for a working group EU LAC. So we are a network of civil society organizations in Europe where we have Concord, the EU LAT uh, network, OIDACO network, and some of the member organizations, 111 CNCD and 111 Oxfam Solidar, WSM, or the NGO Federation in Spain, as well as other organizations that have been working for a long time in Latin America and countries in the Caribbean, such as Pax Christi International or the Heinrich Ball Foundation. From a working group, we follow up the political, economic, and uh, cooperation relationships between the EU and uh, Latin America and the Caribbean so that they are respectful in terms of human rights. First, we would like to thank you for your participation, for, the, for your participation in this online meeting. I'd like to inform that the languages we will be using are English and Spanish, and we have simultaneous interpretation available. Judith is the technical support officer of uh, the event, and she will be sharing some information with us now. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon from my part as well. I would like to welcome everybody who joined us. And uh, I would like to say a few words about interpretation. If you haven't worked with this platform with interpretation yet, then uh, this will be a novelty to you, but it's very straightforward. Please look for the globe symbol. Uh, on uh, the bottom of your of your screen and you will be able to see language interpretation there if you're working from a mo from a mobile device it will be more or three dots uh, where the interpretation menu opens you can select between spanish and english these are the two channels that we use or you can turn interpretation off completely with the off selection and then you will be listening to the floor at any time. At the, at the end of this session, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions, uh, please indicate it in the chat. Do not raise your hands with the raise hands uh, button. We are not going to use it at this session. Indicate your uh, question or the fact that you have a question in the chat and the moderator, Rosa, will uh, call you to ask your question live. When you ask your question live, uh, please turn on your camera and please, again, switch the interpretation channel of the language that you are going to speak. If you speak English, switch to English. And if you speak Spanish, switch to Spanish, please, only when uh, you are uh, asking your question. Otherwise, if, you, if we don't have time to answer your question or you feel that you still have some questions unanswered in this session, you can send it uh, to the email address that we will communicate in the chat. One important reminder, this session will be recorded both in English and in Spanish. We will keep the time for the speakers and uh, Rosa will let you know or Alba uh, if you over and overran your time. Please enjoy the session. And if you have any questions, please uh, turn to me in the chat. I am named Tech Support Judith. Please chat me if you have any issues. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Judith. Desde nuestro grupo de trabajo, hemos From querido... working group, we've decided to open up the space between the in civil society in Latin America and in Europe, because we think that this is a key moment for the relationships between both regions. We're particularly concerned with the deterioration of democracy in Latin America. In recent years, we've seen how citizens have lost trust in institutions and how an economic and uh, political elite is uh, accumulating power while there's inequality and violence for the citizens. The impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has triggered an unprecedented socioeconomic uh, crisis. We acknowledge the efforts of countries to stop the outbreak and the need to introduce extraordinary measures. However, those measures 
have always have to fall in line with international law and fundamental rights. The High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, has already warned about the fact that some governments have used COVID-19 as an excuse for human rights violations in the sense of restricting uh, civil liberties and to undermine the rule of law. As a situation, we think that the European Union has to play a key role in advocating and fighting for democratic uh, space, and especially through its cooperation, commercial and political relationships. Right now, we are concluding the negotiations for the new budgets for the EU, including the new instrument for the for international aid. And we have a new plan, the 2024 Democracy Action and the Agenda Plan 2020, 2021-25. Last year, there was a new um, report for EU-like relationships. And in order to implement these plans, we need to have, we thought that we, it was timely that we have this exchange so that we can inform the European authorities about the current context so that they can identify priorities better for citizens at, as a whole. We have three speakers from the region today. They're experts in democracy and human rights. And they will be sharing a brief analysis around the current context. We also have the participation of several European authorities. We have representatives of the European Commission, of the Foreign Aid Service of the EU, and representatives of several political parties. We also have a Q&A session, and as the uh, agenda is tight and ambitious, so that we have time for everybody to speak. We ask you to be brief and stick to the time allocated. My colleague Alice is going to be moderating the chat. In case you have any questions or comments during the debate, you can ask for the floor, as she did explain. And my colleague Alba will be checking the time, and myself I will be showing this card when there is a minute left. We know that summarizing such a complicated context in such a brief time that it is a, a challenge, but we hope that we can all stick to it so that we have a fruitful exchange. We have invited MPs Javi uh, Lopez and Monica Silvana from the SMT uh, group so that they introduce the meeting and so that they can share the initiatives that the European Parliament is undertaking. Javi Lopez is the co chair of the parliamentary. A EU LAC group and Monica Silvana is a member for the relationships with Mercosur and Europe LAC. So, Javi, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Rosa. I'd like to very briefly introduce the session as you have asked us. It is a great pleasure for me to take part in this meeting of civil society organizations and also in the framework of European diplomacy and also in representation of the European Union to speak about the relationships and also about the situation of human rights in the region. It's a matter of concern and we are following this up from Brussels because it is obvious that there has been a deterioration in recent years and this is an evidence that leads us to think and rethink our mechanisms as Europeans to be more effective on the ground and to be more influential in a region that unfortunately in recent years, and especially the last decade due to internal EU crisis and the different problems and conflicts in our own space, has not been uh, on the space that it should have, should not, it should, has not been given the importance it needs in our foreign aid policy. I'd like to mention some new phenomena that we need to pay attention to in the future and right now, apart from the older ones, the first one is the frailty of the democracy and uh, authoritarian regimes. Unfortunately, we thought that democracies were uh, consolidated in Latin America, but some of them are taking steps back and leading towards authoritarian regimes. We've also seen the problems related to COVID-19 and this emergency and how some governments have taken a dictatorial turn. Thirdly, the inability to manage mass mobilizations in many countries with uh, police brutality happening. And I also wanted to mention some broken hopes or frustrated hopes, some processes we were hopeful about, some political processes that we thought were going to bring about peace and prosperity to some Latin American countries 
but unfortunately they have not uh, materialized. So this means that we cannot construct the peace that we want in different countries. And finally, I wanted to emphasize a new phenomenon that has to do with the reality of many environmental defenders, uh, the situation in which they're in, they're being under threat uh, due to different reasons. This is a new phenomenon that we need to manage. What I'd like to say is that the EU has uh, many uh, large array of agreements and treaties with the region, which have to be used to manage fundamental and uh, human rights. That's a very important aspect. Then we also have to rethink the new agreements that we are negotiating. I am for this negotiation, but at the same time, I think that we have to be very demanding in terms of human rights mechanisms. And we have three agreements with Chile, Mexico, and Mexico that are undergoing um, uh, negotiations right now. So we have to think how they can become more effective in terms of human rights. They all have clauses, but many times, this is like a nuclear bomb. You have it there so that you do not have to use it, or that is how the EU has seen this. And this is not effective, that's what's been proven. And uh, finally, I'd like to happily announce that the Council has announced a mechanism to sanction human rights violations uh, for governments and for people. And this is going to be implemented in the upcoming years. And we hope that this has a direct impact on the region. This is a mechanism to uh, have sanctions for governments and individuals, not to whole countries, as we've seen so far. And that they can revert to pitiful situations in terms of human rights violations, as we see in many Latin American countries. So this is the array of options that we have. I'm also interested in the role of the European Parliament and diplomacy, European diplomacy, we will use cooperation aid for that. And I'm sure the next speaker will speak about this. Diplomacy, as I said, is an important element. We have the diplomatic corps and um, both at state, member state level and at European level. And the Parliament has to be, the uh, European Parliament has to be a loudspeaker to uh, make uh, situations visible and advocate for certain causes. We have uh, representatives of uh, different um, groups that will be your allies in all this work. Thank you so much, Javi. Now we'll give the floor to Monica Silvana. Thank you very much, Rosa, for chairing this debate. Thank you to the Secretary General, Mr. Levy, Solidar, ULAC, and the European Diplomacy Service. Mr. Javier Lopez has already summarized in general terms what the topics are for us at the European Parliament and coordination with the Commission. To the concrete question of what the EU can do in Latin America in times of crisis, to answer that question in a very brief time we have, I'll try to uh, cut to the chase. And I think that we have at least five types of crises that, crisis that we are enduring in Latin America. There's a pre-existing crisis in Latin America that has to do with the fight against inequality, a common factor, then a humanitarian crisis. And in Venezuela, a fourth crisis is a political crisis and of course, as democracies that we thought that they were consolidated and they were sold as development models, we realized recently that they were not consolidated. We have complicated cases such as the ones in Peru or Chile. And then that another crisis that is the environmental crisis and how climate changes are having an impact on developing countries and even this uh, medium income uh, countries where there's uh, inequality rampant inequality. What can the European Union do in the crisis of Latin America? And the Socialist Party we have been mentioning for months that we cannot respond to COVID with the same distribution criteria we had before COVID-19. Cooperation and development aid from the EU is going to work through the NICA, to the uh, cooperation 
and neighborhood um, instrument. And we're asking for redistribution of the uh, focus. The focus before was Africa. That was, too, that was very clear. But the 25% for Latin America is insufficient. And this crisis now added on top of the other ones needs to increase the percentage of development aid. So the economic political crisis, by the end of September, there was a publication of a report of the Economic Perspectives 2020 IDEO. And this was produced by OCD and CEPAO. And this report presents the impact, the dramatic impact of the pandemic especially in marginalized sections of the of society. And we also see how Alicia Barsana from Sepal expresses that over 45 million people are going to fall below the poverty line in Latin America, an additional 45 million. So this is forcing the EU to move away from nice words and take action. On the other hand, we have nice perspectives. I think that the EU has to cooperate to reach a new development model. It has to be updated to the post-pandemic situation. Yesterday, there was an announcement of Mr. Borrell and with the economic and digital cooperation initiatives, we will have a new framework next year with a big uh, cable of optic fiber cable between the EU uh, between Europe and Latin America. This is a macro project and it's a very interesting project. And But I'm not just skeptical, but I try to not to fall into Fata Morganas and try to focus on the elimination of inequality in Latin America as the priority issue. We have many tools. The European Union can support specific development programs such as Bridging the Gap and others, sports like, it works very well in Latin America. So I think that the key is also for us to see how we from our European institutions can manage to have the country agreements with, with which we cooperate and with which we have bilateral cooperation so that they can include civil society organizations there too, and have an agreement of those priorities with the civil society of each country. This cannot be just an agreement of the government of that particular country with the EU, but with the participation of civil society. On the last note, we have to go back to this climate crisis, environmental crisis, and what we can do from the EU. As you know, my team and, my team and myself are developing a report uh, for the defense of indigenous people's rights is key to defend biodiversity and uh, adapting to the, to climate change. In Latin America, we have 50% of the world's biodiversity. At the same time, this is a region that's uh, suffering from the impact of climate change. We had hurricanes and earthquakes and, for example, hurricanes in Honduras and other countries. The deforestation of the Amazon, we have tools to do that. And I have... Uh, presented this in the latest Mercosur uh, meeting last um, week, we have tools at the EU level to control deforestation. We passed a report asking the Commission to have a legal framework at EU level to revert world deforestation. And uh, we invited the Commission to support a regulatory framework regarding deforestation at international level. I think that the EU has the tools and we have to use those tools and make them work. As one of the co-chairs of GLAD, Javi Lopez said, we have three agreements, three cooperation agreements that have been negotiated in Chile, Mexico, and Mercosur. And in particular, if we speak about Mercosur, I think that we need to have um, good, regulated relationships and therefore we need to have Mercosur happening, but happening with criteria that uh, are environmentally friendly and that are enforceable at international level. I don't want to go beyond the time, beyond the time that I had allocated and uh, I think that we need to approve this binding legal framework 
about due diligence of companies. That's another debate being discussed in the EU Parliament and it's going to be approved. And I think that these are the most important legal frameworks, uh, binding legal instruments that we have. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I understand and I'm very grateful for the participation of uh, civil society, especially in topics such as development aid, humanitarian aid, to take steps forward and to strengthen our cooperation with Latin America. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for both to both of you for being with us here today. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing for this region from the European Parliament. We've taken note of the things that you said, including being um, tough on human rights respect and how we should also be vigilant of these tremendous inequalities in Latin America to support those uh, countries, especially of medium income. Let's now move on to the context analysis part to give you an idea of the current situation, the current trends that so civil society organizations are living few with at the moment. We've got Ines with us today. She's a specialist at Civicus, which is the World's Alliance for Public Participation. She works at Ork University in Uruguay, and she concentrates on civic spaces, activism, and social movements. Off you go, Ines, when you're ready. Thank you so much, Rosa. I'm going to try and share my screen with you. Let's see if I can get that right. Good. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you so much for having invited me to take part in this event. As you already know, I'm going to give you a general overview of the civic situation and civic organizations in this region. A civic space for us is a physical and virtual space which allows the freedom of assembly, freedom of association and freedom of expression, which the state should allow. It's basically the air that civil society breathes. And we'll see right away that in the case of Latin America, the violations of this uh, civic space uh, carried out by state agents are perpetrated by one state agents. Each state doesn't have the ability or, uh, or willingness to prevent. Let's move on. To assess the quality of civic spaces, we do have what's called a monitor tracking civil space, which tracks civic space. It's got a, a scoring system in which each country in the world appears in one of these five uh, categories, which are open, narrowed, obstructed, repressed, or closed. What it does is it refers to quality of civic space. Echoing what's just been said earlier on, in addition to the score that each country is given, it's also important to look at the analysis of each country, because actually uh, the statistics given officially can uh, pull the wool over our regional or the internal statistics that are offered. So it's not uh, just the classification, but also we need to keep an eye on how it's given. There are many countries that are politically democracies and we look here at the development of the country, it's uh, the quality of its democracy, its electoral quality. So we need to be able to understand the uh, summaries as well as the score that's given. Next slide, please. Our most recent report that we publish uh, last week with data for 2020 gives a very, very um, downheartening uh, outlook where we're seeing civic spaces not being respected. There are three countries that have been downgraded, Chile, Ecuador and Costa Rica. 
This is partly related to the repression of protest uh, movements during the pandemic, but there are also many uh, cases of um, curtailing the action of civil service movements. In Costa Rica, we're seeing attacks on uh, people who defend uh, human rights, on human rights activists, and also attacks on people demonstrating. We're also seeing uh, legislation being passed to prevent protests. In Ecuador, we're also seeing freedoms of protesters being limited. In the case of Ecuador, the government has actually rejected the reports uh, informing of these uh, violations. There's being attacks on uh, demonstrators as well as on journalists. In Chile, there are still protests sporadically, even during times of pandemic, for example, uh, feminist uh, demonstrations, but there's been an increase in the curtailing of freedoms for the Machu Mapuche community. So we're coming to the end of 2020, and what we were seeing are the top five violations of civic freedoms in America are intimidation, harassment, attacks on journalists, and protesters detained, as well as excessive force. So protesters detained and excessive force are the uh, fourth and fifth. As the, for the first, we're talking about tactics like uh, threats, uh, police, repeated police intimidation, and preventing people from in these uh, civic organizations to carry out their work. These tactics we find at least in 22 of the 25 uh, countries that we survey, and they were particularly uh, persistent in Honduras and in Nicaragua. In these two questions countries, as well as in Brazil, Salvador and Guatemala, we're seeing it's an important trend for uh, stigmatizing, for example, female uh, journalists and human rights activists. And when moving on to attacks on journalists, there have been attacks on at least, just at least 15 countries in this region. On many occasions, these attacks uh, took place when these journalists go to cover demonstrations, especially when they're trying to report on cases of corruption. They are attacked. And in this case, for criticizing the government's response to the pandemic in Mexico, which is still one of the countries which uh, ha has most attacks on journalists, there were at least two journalists who were attacked supposedly whilst they were under police protection. And finally, we've seen that they've been protests in at least 25 countries in this region, pre protests for a whole variety of issues, from anger with the economic and social conditions, a lack of uh, civic rights during pan pandemic problems during quarantine. In Paraguay, there were demonstrations for people asking for a flexibilization of the pandemic measures. Almost always the uh, pandemic emergency is being used as an excuse to uh, detain protesters for supposedly violating the uh, sanitary measures. But these are the same that were used before the pandemic. They're just now used, we're using the pandemic as an excuse. Just something quickly to highlight something that other colleagues have said before me, which is that the civic space isn't uniform. There are specific places and specific sectors where there are specific restrictions to civic spaces. And these are usually done by somebody against somebody for a specific reason. 
to avoid uncomfortable situations and to avoid certain uh, civic actors from carrying out their uh, work properly. In the case of Colombia, which our colleague uh, will be speaking about, we've got an increase in detention of people that work for civic organizations during this time of pandemic with uh, political advocates and human rights advocates being detained. But this isn't isolated. There's been also the murder of human rights advocates in Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, and Mexico. The re region accounts for 60% of these number of uh, murders around the world. So quite clearly, indigenous as well, those people that are defending their land are particularly under risk in this region. And things are getting worse. What you're seeing is a summary of some results of a survey in 2019 before the pandemic regarding the resources that are available to civic society. People and organizations that defend human rights have an increasing amount of work to do, but the resources that they have available are increasingly scarce. So that's, this divide is getting bigger. What this piece of research has shown, which I'm not going to go into in detail, is that the major part of the funds that are available for civic societies in this region are for the work that these civic societies are, are covering, i.e. they're doing things, they're providing services that the public sector should be providing, and they're not being used for promoting human rights, activism, or controlling or the, the role which the civil, these organizations cannot be replaced for. And this is very, very serious. The other thing that is highlighted in this research is the possibility of influencing by these civil society organizations is really, really reduced. There's very, very little investment in strength in civil society organizations to encourage activism. So really, there's no future for these organizations. In the short term, this has worsened under pandemic, as has the gap between what these uh, civic societies do and the funds that they uh, receive to uh, carry out their work here. You can see basically the headlines of how civil society is responding to the pandemic. And here you can see the many, many ways that civil society is doing what it can to re lessen the results of the pandemic and its effects on vulnerable uh, sectors of society. And in the same society, civil, in the same context, civil society is, is really firefighting, as it were. It's, it's the work that nobody else is doing. And yet, at the same time, their funding is uh, being jeopardized. I'll leave that up on the screen so that you can see the data. The majority of these civil society organizations are having difficulty obtaining funding at a time when their work is even more vital. And the final slide. I'm going to leave this for later debate, but just to close, when we here you can see the diagnosis that we make. We've 
huge divide between the funds that they have, the ability to carry out their work. And here we can see the recommendations that we've made to our allies, to our donors. All of these are related to the kind of support, not just financial support, but the kind of support that these civil society organizations need to carry on working. These go for the an increase in their recognition and a more critical voice to demand governments to provide civil society organizations with the support they need and also better support to cover operating uh, uh, course and the prevention of no more arrests of these people they need more uh, civil society needs greater empowerment I'll leave these uh, points up there so that you can see them. Thank you so much, Ines. Thank you so much, Thank you so much for having been able to summarize so quickly the Nuestro segundo panelista Our second is panelist is Manfredo Marroquín. He is the founding member of Acción Ciudadana. This is an organization to fight against corruption and transparency. This is the chapter of Transparency International in Guatemala. He is a political scientist and activist with over 20 years of experience, and he will be discussing the political and social crisis that Guatemala is going through right now. You have the floor now. Thank you so much, Rosa. Warm greetings to all of you. In this context that was already described about the region, I'd like to focus on the crisis that Guatemala is going through right now. Guatemala is going through a deep crisis. This is not uh, a matter of the current circumstances. It's a systemic uh, crisis that is supported by the economic and political elites and how they are reluctant to introduce gradual change. The reluctancy, resistance, resistance to these changes has led to a series of problems that have not been solved in recent decades and that are also threatening for the system as a whole. The expelling out of the SIC was an attack on the networks, the economic and uh, political networks that were investigating corruption. And there was increased harassment against judges and advocates, independent lawyers who took part in different investigations and sentences of corruption cases. This week, we had a very particular case against the Advocate General Francisco Sandoval, who is the Advocate General against impunity. And he is being internally harassed by the Advocate General, who named another person, named another special uh, general attorney to investigate this colleague. And finally, this new general attorney had links with a person who was under investigation. And the day after she was named, she was designated the partner of this special um, general attorney was extradited due to drug trafficking. So just imagine this person was uh, designated to investigate the person who's investigating those cases. So this control of the three powers of the state and all the institutions, and it is under what we in Guatemala call the pact of the corrupt. And the few institutions they cannot control, such as the constitutional court or the human rights office, they are constantly harassing them as they cannot control them. And the harassment of these officers has to be also seen in the framework of attacks against journalists and uh, indigenous peoples and farmers. So this is uh, creating an agenda of um, regressive reforms, attacking spaces that were already conquered, including a law for NGOs. This was at the beginning of this year, there was a new bill approved restricting the um, actions of NGOs. This bill was opposed by civil society organizations and we managed to provisionally halt it 
um, thanks to a sentence by the Constitutional Court. To conclude, uh, some recommendations. We need to find cooperation channels that are more direct, and especially with civil society actors who are being harassed and whose uh, spaces are being closed down. We need to find the spokespersons in the business sphere who are more likely to accept reform and changes in the government and power structures. And not in the, in the private sector, there are also important um, allies. And we can apply, for example, uh, the US uh, with the Kinesky law, and they are following, they're prosecuting people who are engaging in human rights violation various violations. And finally, we need to seek for bilateral cooperation that does not favor organizations that are under the control of these political and economical networks that are linked to corruption. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manfredo, for showing us the situation of Guatemala, and this can be also similar to the situation of other countries. To speak about Colombia now, we have uh, asked Marie Monserfon, who is a member of the Cruz Albert Restrepo group and the Colombian platform Democracia Desarrollo. She is a lawyer and a human rights defender, and also in the litigations at the Human Rights Court. And she will be focusing on the criminalization of social protest and attacks to the human rights offenders in Colombia. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the ULAC group for organizing this conference. A greeting to the MEPs, Javi Lopez and Monica Silvana, and everyone who spoke before me. As you know, the peace agreement signed in 2016 between the government and the FARC generated hopes in Colombia to improve the humanitarian situation. And there was the promise that the crimes that were committed were not repeated and that the democratic spaces would open up. Four years after, we see that there's no compliance, that the peace agreement was not complied with. There was uh, the, the other guerrilla, the um, Army of National Liberation, there's no agreement, 60 ex-combatants of the Five were murdered, so this is 255 since the signature of the agreement. We have uh, seen the presence of armed groups in 90% of the national territory, and we've had 79 massacres. We have recorded 79 massacres. They have um, increased since the agreement was signed. The mission created by the peace security to decide how these groups were going to be dismantled has not complied with this mission mainly due to the complicitness of the national government. Then also, if we go back to the most important topic today, and in civic spaces, we have 292 social leaders murdered this year. This is a figure that increases by day by day. And there have been threats also, especially after the mobilization uh, sessions in October. And the attacks on women human rights defenses have increased, and this has to do with gender stereotypes. During the pandemic, we saw an increase of police brutality and militarization. And this is this goes against the peace process we are so adamant about. Many of the demonstrations this year were due were annulled due to the lack of social and economic measures uh, that the pandemic required. We had a, a campaign. Freedom, a matter for all, as documented since August, August 2018, there were 2,154 uh, arrests, 1,700 cases of uh, people who were harmed, 27 of them with eye um, wounds, and they have lost sight. We've had cases of sexual violence, a 72 uh, murder. In March, we had 24 people murdered, uh, 24 inmates who were protesting due to the lack of health measures in jail. And police brutality reached a peak in September when we had social demonstrations due to torture and murder of a person at a police station. And this event 
13 people were uh, uh, murdered with arm, with uh, firearms. Nobody has been arrested so far. And this makes us think, and it makes us think about the murder of Dylan Cruz last year, who was peacefully demonstrating when he was murdered. And this is still ongoing um, process in the military court. Just like the rest of the region, we had cases of uh, gender violence, sexual violence, violence against women, and the calls to the emergency send services uh, increased. That means that we had more support, but there's less research and forensic reports. This means that the pandemic um, produced new obstacles uh, for women to access justice. In this context, we'd like to highlight two positive um, items. First, the, the organizations in the Commission presented a proposal of guidelines for policy that allows to dismantle the groups that are coming after the former paramilitary groups. And the High Court um, sentenced in favor of several organizations for the right to protest and to demonstrate. And it includes the development of participatory protocol to reduce human rights violations in these contexts. Going back to the question of this forum, but can the EU do in times of crisis in Colombia? Jamal, you need to finish whenever you can. So first, uh, the continued financial support of the peace agreement that our government is um, calling to co to comply with the agreement to the veterans and uh, other parties of the agreement. Also to make contributions to the new plan for human rights and democracy and specific measures for that. As Ines said, civic society is the air we breathe and in latin america we're asphyxiating we're suffocating and we want a new pact prioritizing life new social pact thank you so much Yamari, for summarizing the moment that you're going through in colombia and also for this uh, very serious situation that women are going through in particular and we've heard very interesting things some of them also already appealed to the EU and discussed their role, for example, with the consistencies, uh, consistency between uh, internal policies and the impact of foreign policy. So I think we now um, can listen to the vision of representatives of the EU institutions with us. I'm going to give the floor to the European Service of Foreign Action. I have Jacob Tan, who is the Vice Regional Chair for the Americas. You have three, four minutes. Creo que, creo que sí que está conectado. Mm, Jackie. I think he's online. Are you connected? Si no, mientras verificamos, voy a pasar a. Eh, checking, I'm just going to. Um, we can give the floor to the next speaker. From the DG for Cooperation, we've got the head of the section for human rights at the DG for Development, Jonathan Famnerbeck. Please go ahead. Adelante, Jonathan. When you're ready. Sorry, my microphone got turned off. We can't see you, but we can hear you fine. I've got two computers here. Sorry, mine isn't the best connection. Two computers. First and foremost, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you for this very, very interesting and very opportune and appropriate conference, because as you may already know, we are currently beginning what we call a, the programming period, the programming period for our, our funds for 2021, 2028. We still haven't got our budget formally approved, but we're beginning. That's why I recommend my co uh, colleagues, Jomari, 
Manfredo to please get into contact uh, with your delegations in your countries, because what we're doing is we're doing the round of uh, civil society organizations to see what can be done. It's true what uh, Javier Monica said, that there isn't an increase in bilateral funds for countries, but there is an increase in what we call thematic funds, specifically for human rights and democracy, and also funds for civil society. And I'm saying this because I, I fully share the analysis that you've made of this situation. I, I share it with the same analysis that we made at the European Commission, and that's why we think it's important to concentrate on the restrictions to uh, civic space, especially around the world, and not just in, in Latin America, it's a world problem. There will be funds now specifically earmarked to monitor this situation uh, so that civic society can actually alert us of problems as soon as possible via the political dialogue that we have with the governments, with these bilater bilateral funds, because we can force conditions on to the government. For example, when we work with the Colombian or Guatemalan uh, governments, we've got some great projects in Guatemala, for example, and we can monitor them we can monitor any, uh, for example, draft laws that are about to be passed and, and check uh, what, what's going on. And we can also keep our eye on there being credible uh, institutions to the country. The same goes with Colombia, for example. There's some countries where we can work, others where we work directly with the government or the ombudsman or human rights committees or directly with the government. For example, in the case of the UN, we work with the High Commissioner of uh, for Human Rights, Anthony Suela, and there we work with civil society because the funds in that case go directly to the to civil society organisations, to you, so that you can directly change the situation in the country. And this is something which for us is very important to carry on doing. I can confirm that the parliament does support, support that because every single week there are parliamentary questions on the uh, situation in these countries, what we do with these funds. I can assure you that uh, we keep our eyes on what's going on. Rosa, I'm, I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I can hand the floor now to Jakov. He's the deputy head for the uh, Regional Affairs Office for the Americas. Uh, it seems, Jacob, we've got a problem with your mic. We can't hear you. We've got a technical hitch. We can't hear Jacob. So let's see if we can get him back. We've also got with us the MEP TB Metz, who during to a change in her diary is going to have to uh, leave early this event and won't be here for the conclusion. So maybe it's time to allow her to take the floor now. She's an MEP for the Greens and she is president of the Delegation for Relations with Central America. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you hear me fine. Um, yeah, and thank you also for adapting the program a bit uh, as I will have to leave uh, at the, a bit earlier. Uh, so as you told, I'm in the Greens, but I'm also chair of the delegation for the relation uh, with uh, countries in Central America. Um, thank you to all the representatives uh, of the civil society for sharing your views. I have really been listening to it with a lot uh, of attention. From the region I know the most, uh, Central America, there are unfortunately too many examples of human rights violation and it is becoming more and more difficult uh, for human rights defenders to act freely without intimidation, threats and attacks. 
Also, media freedom is under attack, in particular in El Salvador, where President Bukele is putting a lot of pressure on the free media. In Nicaragua, the parliament has recently approved a new bill, which uh, makes it more difficult for NGOs to operate, as they will have to register as foreign agents. Um, the situation for indigenous people is particularly difficult. Only a few weeks ago, I read about the killing of an indigenous mosquito man in Honduras who was killed during uh, an anti-drug operation by either US or Honduran forces. And the day after, another mosquito farmer was tortured and killed by Hungarian military for information about drug operation. And could also talk to you about the hard situation of the Garifuna people in, in Honduras. So they want to have the land in order to make uh, big tourism projects there. There are numerous of other examples of human rights violations, such as the eight environmental activists who are detained in Honduras since more than 15 months now for peacefully having protested against a mining company whose projects uh, uh, strengthened as uh, water sources from the communities. Or the case of Berta Casares, who was murdered in 2016 uh, for having received death threats for successfully having led campaign against the construction of a big hydroelectric them. I believe uh, what we can do from the European Parliament, first of all, is to raise awareness and put international pressure. For, in, for example, I suggested the Guapinol activist and Berta Casares for the Sakharov Prize for freedom of thought this year, and they were voted as one of the three finalists of the Sakharov Prize now, which will be awarded indeed tomorrow in the Parliament. As parliamentarians, we can also act by sending letters to the authorities and making them public, uh, which I do regularly to put pressure to the governments to act. Secondly, we need to do exactly what we are doing right now to continue working with the civil society uh, in the countries to give them support. And now this, all these online tools and video meetings allow that so that we can work with the NGOs on the ground to have first-hand information out of the countries. Certainly, and it was already mentioned uh, through the trade agreements we are having with Latin America. For instance, in the case of Central America, the EU has an association agreement, but it has still not been ratified uh, because of all the EU countries, because the Wallonie and the Brussels Parliament have still not ratified. This is an agreement which is based on three pillars, political cooperation and trade. And now, because it is not ratified, we have only the trade pillar working. And it would be good in this case that the other two pillars were also working. And then the EU, EU has a partnership agreement that is ongoing in place now in Central America. And other things, and they're coming to the end of my short presentation and also uh, making conclusions of what the EU Parliament can do is the respect of due diligence. I look forward for next year when the Commission has promised to present the legislative initiative on mandatory due diligence for company. This is something that we need to follow up and ensure that the legislation becomes an effective tool against human rights abuses and environmental impacts in the supply chains. Uh, we will continue to follow up the situation in the different countries, also during the elections. For example, now we have elections coming up in Honduras next year. And what is important for me as chair of the delegation of Central America is really to have to meet these countries on an equal level. It is only through dialogue, communication, cooperation and mutual exchange that we can things smooth. For me, sanctions can only be of the very last resort because then also communication broke down. And um, I'm coming to the end. Thank you very much. I see you have only one minute. I, I have done the time to excuse myself and I'm very jealous of Jonathan Van Meerbeck that I don't speak Spanish. Uh, I have lessons, but I, 
I'm not advancing very quickly and I don't really find the time. So I'm very uh, jealous of my previous speaker there. So thank you very much for listening. And you see that there's at different levels that we have to continue to act in order to preserve and especially as we heard in the pandemic times that we have really to fight to keep up uh, human rights and environmental defenders rights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tilly, for your intervention and also for all this uh, great uh, work that uh, you do for the region and especially supporting the Guapinol Defenders and Berta Cáceres for the Sakharov Prize. Okay, let's now see if the uh, colleague from the European Union External Action has solved his sound issues. Jakob, are you there? Can we hear you now? Yes, we can. Great. I was thinking about the benefits of the conference the Rio conference that you could speak to everybody. But anyway, here I am. Thank you so much. My name is Jakob Tam. I work at the European Union External Action Service, EEAS. And thank you so much for inviting me, especially for those of you that are in the EU LAT working group for organizing this important discussion and of course, our colleagues from the European Parliament, Javi Lopez, Monica Silvan, and everything that they're doing to encourage our relations with this very important region. I'm really, really pleased as well to see that there's uh, many participants from the other side of the Atlantic who, so that we can listen firsthand to the concerns that they have. Some of you heard our high representative, Josep Borrell, the other week when he spoke, he spoke to the NGO forum and he spoke a little bit about, he gave us his uh, vision of the situation. I think his message was clear. And 2020 hasn't, of course, been a good year for human rights. I've seen not just in Latin America, but around the world, how the COVID-19 pandemic has been used on many occasions as a pretext to curtail even further civil society organizations. And to, this has led to even more human rights violations what our high representative uh, said at the time and the our colleagues from the parliament have also said is that the last couple of months have been fairly intense here in brussels because we've launched a series of important initiatives which can help us face the tremendous uh, challenges out there. We recently also launched an action plan for gender. We've, uh, as has already been mentioned, launched the human rights and democracy in the EU 2020-2024 action plan. This is a unique situation for us because we've got a global system to calling into account individuals who have violated human rights. It's a very powerful instrument for the work that we're carrying out. As you've already said, 
this difficult global situation is even uh, more worrying in the region that we're talking about now, that is Latin America and the Caribbean. You've uh, obviously given uh, far more sophisticated uh, presentations and far more with far more knowledge that I could uh, offer. The speakers had far more knowledge about the situation of human rights in with the different nuances and uh, all the details that we got from our Colombian colleague. A few things that are relevant in this sense. And the first thing is that it's a time we're currently building our uh, agendas with uh, for our work with Latin America. Yesterday, actually, I spoke to the person in charge of relations with Latin America from the EU. It was a, a virtual meeting. And here we spoke about how we can uh, work together to cope with the pandemic. And it made a important, important reflection about how limited our model is, the many limitations that are out there, and the fact that we need a more sustainable agenda. It needs to be more inclusive. And this, of course, gives us a new um, opportunity. And this is an agenda that needs to go beyond governments, of course. The second thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is the issue of programming and cooperation. As our colleague from NIPCO mentioned, We've still got funds uh, that need to be uh, programmed. Maybe we can organize this well. And to do so, of course, we need to work alongside you to define those priorities and to see what challenges are out there. The third point, and I know time is short, it's running out. The implications of this new, very powerful package of human rights that we've launched at a global level for Latin America, how can we make use of it? How can we make use of this and the other uh, political, uh, economic and commercial tools that can be used? Those are, there's a lot that can be dealt with and we're here to listen to you and any other uh, and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Jacob and Jonathan, for uh, sharing our view and having brought us up to date with the work that the institutions are uh, doing. It's now turn to open debate so you can ask your questions of the European authorities that are here with us today or of the regional experts. Some people have already been asking for the floor through the chat. We have a few minutes, so we ask you to be very brief in your questions and that you please say first to whom you address your question. So we can take three questions first, then we will listen to the answers. Please use your camera and microphone. So my colleagues have told me that the first person who's asked for the floor is Jimmy from uh, IMS Nicaragua. Good afternoon, good morning. From Nicaragua, we're facing we're living in a police state and we have the same similarities in terms of the law that you've mentioned, it's very restrictive. So far, we've asked for an application of a democratic clause uh, that you have in the agreement with Central America. So far, the application of the implementation of this clause has not been um, done in any practical sense. How long can we wait? For, that this, uh, for this instrument to work and respond to the needs that we have in Nicaragua and Central America as a whole, because we are facing a terrible situation. Uh, there's a deep deterioration of human rights and we do not see that the situation is going to improve. Nicaragua is going to have elections in the near future. We know that the repression is going to increase. So when is the time in which 
this is going to be applicable. In fact, because when the treaty was signed, this was presented as a process that was um, important and that was going to be respected and that was going to have an impact on human rights, but so far nothing has happened. So this is a question for the European authorities. Now, I'll give the floor to Marta Inés from ELAC, Press Christie International in Colombia. Thank you. My question for the EU officials and uh, for some MEPs is what do you think the impact of the EU initiative on due diligence in terms of human rights and the environment for the communities who are resisting extractivism in Latin America and who have been subjected to uh, human rights violations, uh, incarceration, contamination, etc. I think that Jonathan already gave um, sent a link but could you please let us know a bit more about this issue of due diligence, human rights and the environment, please? Thank you, Marta. Ingrid Verg, I'm Henrik for Central America. Travel. Hi, I'm from the Henrik Bo office for the Southern Hemispheres, and I have some questions for the EU representatives, especially for the MEPs, because Chile is one of the countries uh, for which a new treaty is being discussed. And Chile moved from narrow to obstructed. However, there is a massive violation of human rights that have not been registered. That most of the products exported to the EU have um, lots of water in a state that does not ensure the human right to water. So how could we have human rights instruments within this agreement so that we could improve the situation um, in terms of human rights in Chile? Thank you. So you can answer now very briefly. Maybe Chile, as you have to leave earlier, if you want to take the floor, and then we'll give the floor to the other colleagues. Yes. Yes, so in, indeed, I've heard the, the two first questions. Uh, I've heard Central America and then, uh, um, yeah, so it's a good question. How long do we have to wait in order to have this association agreement? Right now, as I said, we have a partnership, like a, a partnership agreement with Central America, but this doesn't go far enough in the cooperation and also in the political point of view. Uh, as I said, only the trade pillar is, is now applicated, is implemented. So I deeply regret that. What we do as a, in a, a delegation of Central America, we really try to keep contact now. And, and that's really, but it's all all is more difficult in COVID times, of course, but that's no excuse. In 2021, we really want to go um, and talk with the Belgian authorities because indeed it's Wallonie, so one part of Belgium and the region of Brussels who has to who have to ratify that association agreement in order that we can implement that. Uh, I hope. I, I cannot pronounce anything, but I hope that we have a constructive uh, uh, discussion on that really in 2021, because it's the only country. And I think then we can have more impact and better cooperate if we have indeed this association agreement. That's not, I'm not saying that we have it in 2021, but we have to keep on negotiating in order to have it, especially you mentioned Nicaragua, but also Guatemala, Honduras, uh, it, it could give us another impact and another uh, quality of co cooperation. And then regarding the question of uh, due diligence, um, our commissioner of uh, jury, um, uh, Rendes, he really promised that there were things happening in, in, in really in a legislative that we have really mandatory tax that human rights that there should be no trade uh, if human rights are not guaranteed and if the environment is not duly protected. So still there, there is not a tax on the table, but I think it would really come uh, that or I think that we have really hope that it's going to come in 2021 or maybe 2022 that we can really work on that. And I think that will definitely bring some change. Yes. So I'm looking really forward that we have this uh, legislative, which is then going to be an obligation. Thanks a lot.
Quizá Jacob o Jonathan. Maybe Jacob or Jonathan. Um, sí. Um, pues, um, eh, hubo algunas preguntas sobre los... Yes, eh, okay, there were some questions regarding the different agreements that we are negotiating in Central America and also in Chile. Thank you so much for your questions. I think that we need to generally state that the topic of human rights is a topic that we address through different channels, different political channels and different cooperation channels and also within this new generation of agreements, of partnership agreements. These are not just trade agreements. These are wider agreements that we're negotiating with the region, and we include Mexico and Mercosur there as well. We think that these agreements are part of this larger package that we use to deal with um, human rights and to tackle human rights issues with the countries. In these partnership agreements, we have several possibilities, several areas that could be addressed in political dialogue or else um, in sector-based discussions. What these agreements provide is a framework, and this is a, a framework agreed by the two parties so that we can discuss uh, common interest topics such as, for example, human rights. And this is a wide framework we have for human rights, those um, partnership agreements, and of course, free trade agreements are another part of these package of this wider package. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm not sure whether you want to add something else. Yes. Regarding Nicaragua and due diligence, we have to make a distinction between economic sanctions that have an impact on a country, and then the possibility of specific individual sanctions on officers of the country, such as the case in Nicaragua. And I think there's great news that we have an instrument for sanctions, for individual sanctions in the field of human rights. Mendinsky law, as the colleague from Guatemala was mentioning, but at EU level. These are specific sanctions for individuals and it will not have an impact on the general population as such. And regarding the new European proposal of due diligence, we have to once again make a difference between trade agreements that have an impact on exporters uh, in Latin America and the impact of importers, those companies based in Europe. They are going to be responsible before a court of a whole value chain. So they will have, they will compulsorily have to force Latin American partners to comply with those measures. The problem is that this proposal has not been submitted. It will be submitted next week, next year, and this is a horizontal proposal. Right now we have specific measures for certain sectors. For example, for mining, we have a proposal for gold mining, tungsten and titanium, but we didn't have an, a law a directive at European level that uh, is applicable for all sorts of imports into Europe. This is the proposal that we want to have as a directive next year. Thank you so much. We also have Olivier Coupler with us. He's from DG Trade. He's a coordinator for trade relationships with uh, Central America and Mexico. So he has the floor now. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you for the invitation to this working group meeting. Indeed, uh, I'm um, in charge of the relationship, trade relationship with Central America. As Tulio Metz was saying, um, and maybe Tulio Metz was saying, 
the um, political and cooperation pillars are not working so far, depending from um, Belgium's approval. But we have the trade pillars, though, where we have a chapter on uh, trade and sustainable development. To some extent, this allows for a dialogue around uh, labor law, labor rights, and we follow the labor conventions of the World uh, Labor Organization, International Labor Organization, and other global conventions. This year we had a committee and we had a chance to discuss with the different uh, Central American states topics such as uh, right of uh, association, violence against trade unionists. We also discuss uh, the topic of child labor. And of course, during those meetings, during those discussions, we also uh, spoke about environmental topics and how to see sustainable if sustainable development and we had many presentations in the subcommittees in terms of the green deal pact the green deal policy of the eu and the role that um, the, the central american countries will have in adapting to these new environmental standards and this chapter on environmental and um, development, a sustainable development, there's also um, an indication of the work with the civil society. And we had a um, sustainable development board, and we had meetings with civil society organizations to discuss those recommendations or those proposals. Apart from this window that we have, um, to discuss environmental and human and labor rights topics. There's a new element um, in DG trade, and I think that's important for you to be aware of too. On 16th November, the commission launched a complaint system, and this is going to strengthen the possibility for the member states, for Central American states, for civil society, for any citizen in the EU to submit a complaint in case uh, there were of human uh, of a violation of an agreement included in the partnership agreement, a clause in the partnership agreement. The system was launched on the 16th of November formally, and you can access it on our website, uh, the website of DG Trade. And we see how you can see there how a complaint can be submitted. And this is something we were doing in recent years. We have this uh, open dialogue with the um, with the states of Central America and civil society. But now we will also have a formalized system, and this will be introduced step by step from next year onwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olivier. We only have two minutes left. So this is the end of our meeting. I'm afraid we do not have time for more questions, but you can be in touch with us uh, for follow-up to on the email addresses that we're going to paste on the chat. We hope that the information that we've shared today is useful for all of us to continue working, strengthening the relationships between both regions. As we have heard during the session, the EU can play an important role in that process, and we hope that the most important uh, demands of civil society are heard, and that we go for a model of the relationship that's based on human rights and with a gender approach from a working group, EU-LAC working group. We will follow up the ideas and the seminar and the proposals shared, and we hope that this dialogue is open also with the EU authorities, and we will invite them for a follow-up meeting next year. That's all from our side. We'd just like to thank you on behalf of the whole group. Thank you for your participation in this event, and especially our panelists and the authorities, the EU authorities who have been with us I'd also love to thank the interpreters for the great work 
and everyone for your support and for making this event possible. Take care and good afternoon, everyone. Gracias. 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 Excelente. Muchas gracias. Gracias.